You are now tuned into the Sociology Podcast. Sociology is a lifestyle brand that analyzes Chicago culture and connected topics abroad. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Last week we joked and we laughed about being lost on Lower Wacker Drive because it's facts. You can really get lost on Lower Wacker Drive if you're not careful. This week we're going to revisit Lower Wacker and Upper Wacker. I talk with a man who discusses a friendship he developed in a very unorthodox, unlikely, and unimaginable situation. All right, so Joe, um, you, what type of company that do you work for? Like, how would you categorize it? Is it construction management? Yeah, I mean, we're an engineering firm, uh, which you know we 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 support and provide construction management services as an offspring. Okay. And in the early 2000s, uh, can you explain to us about a project you had, your company did downtown, specifically uh, the Wacker Drive area? Oh, most definitely. Um, In early spring of 2000, to be exact, uh, my company was awarded a contract Mm -hmm. uh, and we were awarded the contract as joint consultants. So that, that, you know, comprised of multiple consulting firms. Uh, for the city of Chicago uh, slash Department of Transportation's Wacker Drive. Uh, there were uh, two phases. We had phases two and three out of three phase, two and three out of three phases. So uh, of the construction or reconstruction project, keep in mind that phase one was already in effect. Okay. okay. So the project primarily included you know, the reconstruction of upper and lower Wacker Drive, all right, the rehabilitation of, all right, and anyone that's familiar with lower Wacker Drive, uh, specifically, because upper Wacker Drive is just a drive through, but to go on the lower level, it's almost like dark city, right? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Right, so anyone familiar with that location, they usually like kind of preface it with like the Blues Brothers filming back in the early 80s, okay? However, uh, there was more to Lower Wacker Drive than met the eye, all right? In fact, Lower Wacker Drive served as a place of refuge for like hundreds of the Chicago's homeless. And, uh, you know, growing up, a lot of people I know, like family members, um, refer to it as the uh, Wacker Motel. Um, that's, that's something that I heard in reference to Lower Wacker Drive a lot. Um, because like you said, there's definitely a lot of unsheltered homeless citizens down there. So when you guys started this project, spring 2000, um, you had phase two, phase three, walk us through what the early stages of what your company had to do to basically notify, uh, the residents of Lower Wacker Drive about what was about to happen. Oh, definitely. Um, so as part of the CM team and in the early stages of the project, keep in mind that phase one is already in effect. So uh, the majority of the homeless that had been replaced or displaced from Lower Wacker Drive between Franklin and Dearborn. All right. Uh, let me rewind. OK, so phases two and three, uh, phase two specifically, Uh, required the reconstruction between Randolph, which is the north-south leg of Wacker Drive, Mm -hmm. to the east-west leg, Franklin, okay? So from Franklin to Dearborn on Wacker Drive east-west, that was the uh, portion of the contract or project that was already in effect, okay? So those homeless, uh, you know, residents had already been displaced. So basically, they just scattered, you know what I'm saying, to the, you know, the, the safe refuge, which was the opposite sides. So the uh, phase three portion was from Dearborn, all right, to Wabash, all right? So we had, at that point, consumed everything from Randolph to Wabash, okay? That was Got our it. process. We were going, we were about to consume everything. And all of the homeless people uh, were gonna be displaced. Uh, and it's unfortunate, you know what I'm saying? So what we had to physically do is go down in teams and knock on tents, uh, shake uh, blankets and wow. all of that, which was dangerous, right? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, inform inform these residents 
because I do call them residents out of respect uh, that, you know, we were about to, you know, commence with construction and for safety reasons, they would have to relocate. Okay. Yeah. Many of these, you know, residents, they actually resisted. Okay. And, you know, we, we had expertise and profanity thrown at us and, you know, it's, it's those situations where you have to get the proper authority involved, meaning the police officers. In some some cases, the police officers had to come and remove them from their locations. Wow. Yep. Wow, that's that's so unfortunate. And, and your team had to do this, so it wasn't like you know CPD or uh, Chicago um, people on the on the city's payroll that was tasked to do this. It was your team that had to do it. Your company that was pretty much forced well, to deliver well, this bad we, news we were yeah we were kind of faced with the you know the liability of informing them and um i'm sure that there are contract laws uh that we could have probably looked into and like resisted but in a team of like in the effort or team partnering aspect i mean we complied it's like you know we're here yeah i mean let's go down and you know try to inform them you know what i'm saying like in a in a in a way that's you know admirable right like yeah. we respect your location but you know we're about to start construction and from a safety standpoint you know you guys will have to relocate you know what i'm saying because of falling debris and all of that and we were going all the way down we took out the entire upper deck of wacker drive mm -hmm. so um that means that you have no shelter all right, you're exposed to the elements. I mean, rain and all of that. I mean, anything, inclement weather, anything's coming down, is coming down on you. Yeah. So we wanted to give them advance warning and not like strong arming anyone. We were just, it was information only. It wasn't, yeah, you, you are mandated to move. I mean, that was the soft, uh, in, you know, like, you know, inquiry or soft uh, information to them. And beyond yeah. the soft, when they resisted, then we brought in the proper authorities. And I think that's the, the right approach in any situation. Got it. And um, so as you and your team are um, delivering this news, letting them know, letting the citizens of Wacker Drive know what's going on and what's about to continue to happen and, you know, escalate, well, not escalate, but, you know, go into further stages. You met a man. Um, how did this conversation go when you stumbled across him? You know, walk us through that. <laughs> Seriously, um, you know, so after we uh, went through our process and all of the residents, uh, literally all of the residents were like relocated uh, because it had to happen. I mean, there were delays to the contract, you know, as a result of the resistance, right? But uh, once this was all in place and all of the residents were out, uh, we commenced construction and uh, we started on like the lower Wacker Drive utility work. So uh, we put in a whole utility or system. We put in, you know, storm sewers and all that on the lower level. So it's just like building a house. You start from the ground level up. Yeah. This was even before we started demolishing everything, right? From the upper level. So we were trying to get ahead of the game, uh, putting in the utilities and this, that, and the other. Um, so the upper level was still accessible. Uh, going about my normal construction activities daily because I'm I inspect right I make sure that the contractor is building the contract in conformance with the plans and specs okay Got so it. um just a normal day and you know I get to um I think it was Wacker and Lake Street it was Wacker and Lake Street and there was a gentleman standing at the corner there there's a lot of little restaurants over there too that we had to keep in you know, in the loop on everything because they had to maintain their business under our construction activities. Correct. So this gentleman, he approached me, you know, well, he didn't approach me, I approached him because I was on foot, he was standing still, but he was soliciting for money, all right? And that money was for food. He's, his claim was he wanted something to eat. So, and his words were, and I quote, he goes, young man, I could never forget this. He says, young man, uh, can you spare a couple of dollars for something to eat? And my mental, my initial mental response, you know, mentally, I didn't say this verbally. I said, right. hell no, right? <laughs> I mean, because 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like you get this all the time, driving or whatever. Yeah. People yeah. running up to your car. Hey, you guys loose change, loose change, this, that, another. But um, it was something about this man that really pricked my heart, right? Mm-hmm. And as well as as he was a well spoken, coherent, you know, man. And it's like every once in a while, you know, God, because I'm a God believer, and God awakens your heart. You know, and he 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 just wakes up your gift of discernment. You know what I'm saying? It's like something about that man, you know, made me look at him a little different than others. Okay. Yeah, you, you knew it wasn't just a typical, do you have anything yes. to eat? You knew it was something different going on. It was on something here. different about him, right? So as a result, you know, I I proceeded to, you know, <laughs> offer this this man um a meal in lieu of money, you know, and he accepted. And I agreed to join them for a sit down and, you know, an opportunity to break bread. OK, so with a man really who you never met no before, idea. you don't know who huh? he is. You don't know who this man is or nothing. But you you chose to buy him some food and sit down with him. My spirit. Yes. Yeah. yeah. My spirit pricked me. You know what I'm saying? And, and mind you, I had no idea that this, you know, this this sit down or this interaction, you know, to break bread with him you know, will be the start of an ongoing standing appointment, breakfast that is, you know, as time permitted, because I'm working and I couldn't have a standing appointment with him, you know, but this, this happened over the period of like three years. Three years and you guys would meet. So how, how would you find him? Or what was your, you guys rendezvous point? His rendezvous was the same. He's he posted up, he posted up at Wacker and Lake. Lake. Yep. And I mean, if I didn't tell you who he was, I mean, his name was John. He never told me his last name. So I just always called him because I'm a Q. I said, John Q. Mm-hmm. John Q. Public, you know, because that's that's a, that's a name out there. I was like, John Q. Public. And I eventually started calling him Old Man John. And I was like, do you mind if I call you Old Man John? He's like, nope. He said, I have no problem with that. So. Old Man John. And so you were, you guys would meet up like once a week um, at Wacker and Lake have something to eat um what what would you guys talk about well i mean we we talked about life you know what i'm saying and and mind you like it wasn't even every week i mean it was like as time permitted yeah you know okay. because the schedule the construction schedule uh would not allow me to like be at the same location at the same time every day or every week but as often as i saw him and he was there every day I would see him and walk past him and I speak, but it's like, I couldn't sit down at the moment. But when time permitted, I would sit down and say, Hey, old man, John, you want to go out at breakfast? And he'd be like, yeah. He's like, and he always, he always complied. He was always like willing to have a sit down with me. Mm-hmm. You know, and we would talk about things like life. Right. And yeah. these, these over time, these, this, this is when I really found out, you know, how deep this was, you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, it was, uh, first of all, I told you it was something about him. Right. But then to find out that he was a, an accomplished lawyer, right? A com- a lawyer. A, an accomplished lawyer, not just a lawyer, but an accomplished lawyer. No, he was an accomplished lawyer, right? Wow. So he, he sits here and, you know, he's spilling out his life to me over time. And I'm sitting here like, I'm, st- I'm the student. I'm always the student, right? So I'm sitting there like, wow, you know, and, you know, the fact that he lost his wife, not to death, but to his transgressions, whatever they were. I never delved, delved into those at all. Um, he, has, he has children or had children. Um, and for whatever reason, be it drugs, alcohol, uh, whatever addictions he may have had, money, gambling, whatever, that was never my intention or, or my desire to seek or know. Yeah. All right. Just the fact that he was a man of honor, in my opinion, and he admitted to his transgressions. And he also said, and I quote him on this, he said, I deserve to be where I am. And I asked him, I was like, hey, do you even want, you want like shelter? Because they have shelter, you know? And I mean, you know, homelessness is a form of mental illness. You know, people result to homelessness, you know, they, they're mentally ill, but some of these people have real reasons out here in the world as to why they don't want that assistance. You know, they, they, we, we call it self-medicating, right? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, this was his remedy. He, he was happy. He was. It's like he was free. 
He was. He was free. But at the same time, he still had demons. You know what I'm saying? Because I could tell. You know what I'm saying? He knew that he had, you know, established something out here in the world that he was responsible for, but he couldn't fix it. You follow me? I follow you. Okay. I follow you. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like one of those things where, you know, just the, the contrast of life. Like, you know, he not only was he a lawyer, but he was an accomplished lawyer, as you accomplished. said. Accomplished. Uh, which yeah, means he, he won a lot yeah. of cases, you know, he made a lot, a lot of, of money for that's, his clients or whatever yep, it have you. That's a difference. Yep. And then you go from that to the opposite end of the spectrum. Cause you know, you know, in, in America, you know, we talk about, uh, it's, it's a capitalistic country, right? So, you know, when we, when we talk about uh, success, lawyer is like one of those professions that pop in people's minds, you know, doctor, lawyer, things like that. You go from that extreme right. of success on the spectrum to the extreme of poverty on the spectrum. And yet right. it seems like even though he still had demons, um, we all have demons, but you know, even though he still had guilt. demons and, and guilt, it's kind of like he, would you say he kind of made peace with the way things were? I think, yeah, I think he took, he, I think he had enough dignity to take peace. You follow me? I do. Um, he was proud in a lot of ways. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, you know, there's certain things that, you know, we would talk about and he was like firm. He was firm on it, you know, just like, I don't want any assistance. I don't want, I don't want shelter. You know, my form of shelter is my shelter. You know what I'm saying? When they do have legal and legitimate forms of shelter where he could have a one bedroom, single room, you know what I'm saying? They call them SROs, single room occupancy hotel room. He could have that. You know what I'm saying? He could have his own place, but he was like, no, this is my penalty. And I choose. And he said that he said, I choose this route. He said that. He, he chose not to remove that thorn. Uh, yeah, he chose not to remove it. He chose not to remove it. And you know what? Uh, while, while we're on this subject, you know, the one thing that I took a lot of pride in was, you know, like building up his dignity or, or like, you know, you know, like, like a, almost like a kickstand, right? Because when we were sitting in the uh, restaurant, the breakfast spot, and he, his favorite, he, he, all, all he wanted was coffee and oatmeal. So that was my meal too. I had coffee, oatmeal, I put raisins and, you know, cinnamon and all my stuff. But we had, that was our meal. That was our signature meal. That's like, you want the regular Mr. John or old man John? He's like, yeah, give me the regular. Have a little bowl of oatmeal and a cup of coffee, man. And um, I think, well, let me, let me say, I know that, you know, when the people in that establishment would see me and old man John, because I would have on a, you know, a safety vest. I had my hard hat on when I walked in. They knew that I was a, you know, a public servant, meaning a worker, and old man John was homeless. But I think that the perception changes when we lend ourselves, you know, to the less fortunate, you know, and show that we support them. Yeah. You know, everybody don't have, you don't, you don't have to throw everybody in the gutter. You just don't. At the end of the day, we're all still people. We you are. You know, we're all we still are. humans. Um, yeah, and just are. because whether you live in a mansion or the Wacker Motel, as some people refer to, like I said, growing up, it doesn't change the fact that you're more human than I am or vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, so you said this went on for three years. Um, yeah. You know, you uh, spring of 2000, literally spring of 2000 to like spring, April of 2003. That's when we wrapped up the project. Yep. And when you wrapped up the project, you didn't see old man John again. Well, I ended up going off to another project. So, yeah. I mean, that's the construction management business. It's like we propose projects and we, you know, earn or win proposals and we have to keep it moving. So, Oh man, John, mind you, I mean, he didn't have any form of, you know, communications like a phone or any of that. He was yeah. just, you know, out here living, you know, and it's funny. Um, it's funny that you brought that up because they, they have a form of, you know, communications. I mean, the homeless, I mean, they have their own form of communication. And it took me back 
So like when we grew up, when we didn't have cell phones, um, I don't know if you were born in that. Uh, you couldn't have been born in that era. Um, uh, when we didn't have so, cell phones? So, uh, most of the 90s. You yeah, know. cell phones didn't exist. Oh, yeah, I wasn't born in that era. Yeah, cell phones didn't exist, you know, in the 70s and 80s when I was growing up. Right. right. They didn't they didn't exist. And it was almost, you know, like you had the town crier. We got information. We asked as it is today, but we got that information. It's it's just amazing how you know, yeah, technology has changed a lot, but you know, back when communication got across all lines. It really did. When did you cross paths with old man John again? Well, <laughs> um, well, let me take you back to like one of my favorite quotes from him, though, when we used to sit down. I, oh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I can't I can't let this opportunity pass. Yeah, please. But we would sit down and he'd like, he said, Ryan, he was like, Ryan, he's like, man, I can't wait until you all are done with my new condominium, you know, because he was waiting <laughs> on the opportunity to move back down there, right? And it's like, I was like, I would I would share these stories with my wife, right? And you, you know, you know, I have a black wife, obvious. Uh, but I'm, I used to almost think like she thought I was making all of this up, right? Mm -hmm. So I would bring these stories to her about my interactions with old man John. And she's like, you know, she said, yeah, me to death. And oh, okay, that's nice. You know, but <laughs> in the back of her head, it was like, she think I'm on some BS, right? So um, over the years, it's like, I, would, man, I was like, man, I wonder if old man John doing all right down, you know? And I was like, we should probably drive down a little whack and just, she was like, uh-uh, you know, because it's like, it's no She said no. Nope. No, she said, uh-uh. Yeah, yeah, uh-uh. Nah. She didn't say nope. She said, uh-uh. Uh, because it's, I mean, it's like a speedway down there, right? Yeah. It's nowhere to park it's like unless Gotham you go City. to like the docking, docking stations and then you foot it. You got to park in the docking, the loading dock, and then you have to walk everywhere, right? So that was not an option. And, you know... We wrapped up in 2003, a uh, couple of years passed. Uh, one particular year, we, my wife and I were like, you know, like filling ourselves, you know, cause we, we've been together a long time, my wife and I. We were like, let's just go down to Hyde Park. So we went to Dixie Kitchen. Uh, we had a meal uh, and we were, we had parked right there in a the lot at Dixie Kitchen on like Lake Park uh, 53rd, so to speak. And, you know, we ate, we were on our way back towards 53rd and we were like, hey, let's go see if the Tiki Room is still open. You know, Tiki Room was a bar uh, and they sold like the, uh, the really strong drinks, right? Yeah. They called them zombies. I heard about the Tiki Room. Never been <laughs> right. there, but I heard about it. Right. But we're on our way there. So I see this guy. It's like, man, wife and I old hands walking. I was like, man, that look like, man, he walked just like old man John. It's like he got the swag. Because old man John had that, I ain't in nobody's hurry, man. You know, it's like. Mm hmm he just I'm had that, own time. Yeah, he had that calm about him. And it's like, out of nowhere, it's like, I instinctively go, oh, man, John. <laughs> and this dude turns around slowly, right? I could almost see it like it was yesterday, okay? He turns around slowly. And my wife, I was like, I said, Ron, that's, that's, that might be him. We start walking fast, right? We walk fast. As he slowly turns around, I get up to him, man. I was like, man, oh, man, John. And he looked at me, he go, Ron? I was like, Ron? He say, construction Ron. I was like, yeah, construction Ron. He's like, man, it's so good to see you. And you should have seen the look on my wife's face. Mm. She was sitting there like. She was like, damn, he was telling the truth all these years. He wasn't bullshitting. He like, wasn't bullshitting. I, I, told, I, I go, I told you, I told you, <laughs> right? So we sitting there laughing and, you know, you know, just, reminiscing and all that, you know, about the times we sat down. It's like, I had to tell him, I said, you know, I said, you taught me a lot, man. He said, you, I said, you taught me a lot about humility. Uh, you taught me how to look at, you know, homeless people from a different light because I, I didn't at that time. I was like, you know, I was like, okay, they, they homeless, you know what I'm saying? But I never really looked at the fact that, you know, them just like us, we like one decision or situation from being in their position. Yep. And living you know, in that wacker condo, just like yeah. he was. He no, was. no, seriously. And it's yeah. like yeah. we we 
we have to keep that in mind, man. I mean, as we go along our way, don't, you know, humility is everything. I mean, don't, don't, don't put yourself in a position where you don't think this could happen to you. Cause it could be one major medical situation with one of your children, your spouse. I mean, this could change the whole dynamic of how you live. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. And I, you know, for, 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 for everything that, you know, we're talking about here, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this to you, like with, with all sincerity, man, it's like, I, I didn't want to know what his situation was. I didn't want to compromise our friendship by digging into his life like that. But he did volunteer the fact that he lost it all and he had it, you know what I'm saying? And I, I, I know he had, because the level of articulation that he spoke with, you don't get that on the street. Absolutely. And what year was this when um, you and your wife saw old man John in Hyde Park? I, I want to say it was 2007. So about four years it wasn't after. Any so, it, wasn't any, it wasn't any sooner than that, because Barack Obama was uh, elected in 08. This had to be, it was, it was either 2007 or mid-2006, you know, but I didn't document that, you know what I'm saying? But I Got know it. it was one of those years, yeah. Got it. And you, and you haven't seen him since, right? No, I haven't. I mean, because again, yeah. he, he still didn't have any form of communication. Correct. I said, so basically I was telling him, I, he, what well, he said, he'll see me in traffic, but I was like, yeah, I mean, I guess I will. Right. So if, 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 uh, you know, circumstances permit, we will see each other, but he didn't have any form of communication. Yeah. And he had actually, he, he did actually tell me he had relocated from lower West. Okay. So he left the condo as he called it. That's um, what he called. It. He loved yeah, the car. He wasn't there anymore. He's like he, he had relocated from Little Wacker, and I, I almost knew that was going to happen because what we what we actually did when we um, you know reconstructed the area, all the areas that were accessible to the homeless, they actually put like a wrought iron fence up there from the barrier wall to the bottom of the upper Wacker Bridge, so people they wow. couldn't get over in there. You know, there was no way you could access it. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So yeah, it's uh, kind of like they wanted to keep them out. Yeah, it's like gated. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It's like back back then it was all open. So you could jump over the median and you could like camp out and all that type of stuff. But what I have noticed um post Wacker, and you know, that's been almost 20, well, 21 years to be exact, you know, since we started that. Um, if you drive anywhere along um drive anywhere along uh the Kennedy, the start of the Kennedy, which is, you know, circa 22nd Street uh, going north. If you look over to the east and west uh, of the expressway, that's almost like Tent City. It's the, it's the equivalent of like what they have in uh, New Orleans. Yeah. You know? Yep. Yep. Um, it, yeah, it, it, it is. It's Tent City all over the place over there. Um, yeah. And, you know, is is I don't know if you've been following in the news real quick, but, you know, Texas had passed a law down there in their state to where homeless, uns unsheltered citizens can't even do that anymore, you know, or else it's a fine punishable up to $500 or jail time. It's, it's, it's yeah, crazy. I mean, how stuff. are they going to pay it? Exactly. I, don't I know mean, you follow what I'm saying? I get it. I get it. Because, you know, oh, do the, does this take them off the street and give them shelter, right? But are they still bound by the same you know, rules that a uh, hardened criminal is, you know, bound by. Man. Yeah. State Just of something Texas to think about. Yeah. Huh? State of Texas for you. Yeah. yeah. Just something to think about. I mean, that, that's the first thing that jumps out at me. So I'm like, how are you going, how are you going to arrest a, 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 an innocent, uh, you know, citizen? I mean, they didn't do anything. They just trying to find shelter. Exactly. It's kind of like they're evicting people who already don't have a quote unquote home in a sense. Right. Is right. yeah, it's wow. So if you um you know if if by some chance that old man John was listening to this podcast somewhere, what would you say to him right now? I would say I I I honestly I, I would tell him I love him. I said and he uh really like brought focus to me, just like I said earlier, like to um you know, the way I look at, you know, the less fortunate, you know what I'm saying, the homeless and the way I approach charity, 
you know, uh, being in a you know situation where I was in a come up in a large family. I mean, I I knew, you know, what it was like to be, you know, sacrificial and humbled and all that type of stuff. But until you like encounter it outside of your blood or your 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 vein, right? It's like you don't really know how to you don't know how to address it or approach it. And you know, for years, you know, you know, I, I didn't think I was better than anybody, but you know, I was always like apprehensive to just be that giving person to everybody that I saw because like my dad told me, he said, Hey, you, you get out of way, you know, you get out of way at this block, you get away at that block, you're gonna be broke by the time you get to where you're trying to go. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. So that's the mindset for you like, know, majority, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but I, I took that approach and I was like, well, it, excuse my expletive, but I was like, fuck it, I ain't give you shit. You know, so that was my mentality pre, you know, encounter with Old Man John. But I think uh, the fact that I had an opportunity to sit down and, you know, really, you know, get to know him, you know, and his, all of his angles, you know, I mean, not as intimate as, you know, he probably would have wanted to share because I wasn't his counselor. I was just a friend over time that he had grown to know. Um, I think it benefited both of us, you know, the fact that he, you know, was able to share his story, right, to a degree and, you know, understand my story, you know, and not look at me as, you know, some snotty nosed black man that, you know, was granted a job with a hard head and a vest and thought he was better than somebody. Yeah. You know, I didn't, I didn't come off to him as that, you know, and I knew that I had, you know, you know, his trust, I know, and I would be able to, you know, talk to him in any, you know, you know, civilized capacity and he could pass that information on to, you know, his homeless, you know, group, the guys that he interacted with. Yeah. And, you know, he could make them better understand you know, what we were doing because we weren't trying to like kick them out. We were, we weren't, it was just a project. So, yeah. It's like, uh, you almost got me emotional there, dude. Well, I mean, you know, (laughs) you know, you just letting it out and you know, it's like you was on Wacker and Lake that day in 2000 to surf. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, I don't like to use the word test, but you know, it's kind of, it was like a test and you pass with flying colors. So, you know, we all need a friend. Friendship is essential to the soul as, uh, yes, sir. as we know. Yes, so, sir. and that's, that's really what it was. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's a good thing. He was a friend to old man, John in that time. Yeah. And it's, 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 it's like, it's funny. Like, um, I recall like probably three weeks ago when I was just, just, talking right and you and you were sitting there next to me and i brought that up right yeah it was like you were so in engaged with it you know what i'm saying like man you know this this is right this right here is like really our purpose you know uh service is it, it is not? It is. It is. We're all it's here like, to serve in one way, shape, or form. It's truly our purpose. I think it's our greatest gift, man. And um, it was just—it it was just like it, it was—it was comforting to my heart, you know. Just so you know, and we are under recording here, so you could pass this on too. It comforted my heart to see a young brother, uh, like so you know, engaged in that conversation, you know, um, because it matters, man, you know, it really matters. Yeah. And, and we have to like step outside ourselves sometimes and just make a difference. So. And any little thing helps, any little thing helps, you know, sometimes really just, saying, just sometimes just saying, you know, have a great day. Yep, can can help. So, yep. Yeah.
If you enjoyed this podcast, I ask for two things. Number one, leave a five-star review. And number two, pass it on to a friend who may enjoy it as well. And don't forget to subscribe to our other podcast, Mogul Motivation from True Stories Media.